I know um, some of the schools near us, it's like the school is literally falling apart um, or they don't have like clean running water and things like that. So it's like, wow. if your school is more worried about those things, they're probably not yeah. going to be as worried about your sex education. Like you need right. those needs met first, you know, and that's what they're fighting for. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Reflections by Lily. I am joined with a very special guest today, um, Ms. Stephanie Roberts. She is a certified health education specialist who specializes in sexual health education. And she's been working in the field for over five years and she's very passionate about the reproductive justice and freedom. And her vision is to empower people to make healthier choices by providing inclusive and accessible sexual health education. And I'm so happy to have her on my channel today. I've all of my conversations with her thus far have been incredible. So thank you, Stephanie, for joining me yes. and welcome. Thank you very, very much. I'm really excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for being on my channel. Thanks for corresponding with me. Well, let's get right into it. First, I'd like to start with just kind of talking a little bit like if you want to introduce yourself and uh, give a little more background about what got you into sex education and what made you very passionate about this. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've just always been really into like empowering people to just be healthy, but i um, in college, I think I took like a sex education course and I just fell in love and I was like, oh my God, there's so many important things. And if more people had known this at an earlier age, there would have been less teen pregnancies, you know? Um, and I know we'll talk about that later, but it just got me really passionate about it. I started to look at like the intersectionalities with sex ed and how there's so many barriers depending on like race, gender, religion, um, language, all these different things that um, people just aren't able to always access this education. So that's kind of like my main goal or vision is to just close that gap. Um, you know, like the inequity gap with sex ed and just try to make it more accessible for people. So, yeah, absolutely. I love that. And you're able to do that through your Instagram page and through other channels. That's actually how I found her. Everyone is on her Instagram page and it was very informative. And I was like, wow, I really want to interview her. Um, and I kind of same thing as you, I took a class uh, my freshman year of college where we talked about the issues with the sex education system in America. And I was just like, wow, I didn't realize, like, I knew the sex education system wasn't that great, but I was like, maybe it's just because like my school or maybe it's just like, maybe it's a more local thing, but no, this seems to be an issue like um, countrywide. And also obviously, and we'll go into this later, but obviously it depends on what part of the country you're located in, but you know, it seems to be a very huge issue. And, and even kind of in that class, I was, you know, prompted to reflect on my sex education. And I was just like, you know, you know, we kind of learn everything around sex, but sex itself, you know? Yeah. And so I think that it's so important to be able to kind of talk about the issues of the sex education system and, you know, at least address it in some way, shape, or form. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So I'm super excited. Yeah. So um, first of all, I'd love to talk to you about like sex ed in schools, such as like high school and college and how those compare and like how's the sex education system in high schools and what are the problems with that specifically in your experience at the very least? Yeah, thank you. Um, So sex ed in high school, I know for me, like it was really awesome. I did have a comprehensive sex ed program, but it was still like very heteronormative. It was still like kind of awkward, you know, like no one was really paying attention. The teacher, mm -hmm. like essentially he knew what he was talking about, but then it's kind of awkward too, like talking about like just different, like birth control and stuff with your male teacher and all mm -hmm. these different things who and he was just very awkward about it. So, I mean, <laughs> I think sex ed in high schools could be like very much improved. I know mm -hmm. I took a poll. Um, I'm like going to look over a little because I need yeah, numbers, yeah, no but, problem. But uh, just asking people, did they get comprehensive sex ed in high school? And if not, where are they getting this information from? Because like I said, for me, I had it, but I know a lot of people that I talk to through my page and um, some high schools that I'm trying to like work with locally, they don't have sex ed in their high school or it's abstinence only or abstinence yeah. and then um here's a like a handout on HIV and that's all you get mm -hmm. for your four years in high school and then moving on so 
I asked um, people on my page, did you get comprehensive sex ed in high school? Um, most people said no. 71% of people said no. And 29% of people said yes. Mm. Um, I asked, did you get comprehensive sex ed at home? So again, comprehensive sex ed is like, it's abstinence, but it's also birth control, you know, periods, mm. whatever, um, consent maybe. Uh, so at home, 13 people said yeah, or 13% of people said yes. And 87% of people said no. So still like mm. you're not getting it at school, you're not getting it at home. And then I said, if you learned sex ed from like maybe friends, cousins, maybe family, um, were you given facts? Uh, so like things that are like actually factual and not just like, if a girl's on top, she can't get pregnant because of gravity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and 33% of people think they got like fact-based education at home or yeah. from friends or whatever. And 67% of people said no. So I think especially like the high schoolers I've worked with, they say if they're not getting it at school or like at home, they're looking online. And a lot of people yeah. look to porn and that's like a whole other conversation I think but that can be really dangerous um looking at porn as your sex education because right that's not what it's made for it's not supposed to be yeah. made for sex education um and so I just think it's like really important in high school to kind of advance um like the comprehensive sex ed in high schools and there's a whole thing that goes along with it I think you have to have a sex ed advisory board um to approve like what's taught in schools And so a lot of those boards, they like have parents sit on those boards or people from the community, professionals, um, different things like that. And so like, if you can look one up in your area, if you have a sex ed advisory board that's at your local high school, you should see if you can like try to get on it because that would be amazing. You can kind of like advance that forward. Yeah. I don't even know. I don't even know if my high school has one. Girl, I didn't know either. Yeah, I didn't even know that. (laughs) No, okay. So um, when I worked at Planned Parenthood, I was like uh, one of the educators there and they were talking about CAB, CAB. And I was like, what the heck is a CAB? And they're like, oh, it's a sex ed advisory board. And that's what is used to like approve. And I know it's in Michigan where I'm at. I would assume it's in other states as well. Like somebody's approving what what goes into the school. Um, But yeah, it was a lot of people like don't know about it. I didn't know about it until like a few years ago. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. That's I'll, interesting. I gotta look into that. I want to see who's on my advisory board. <laughs> yeah, you should. Because a lot of people like don't know about it, right? They pull from right. parents and stuff or other professionals mm-hmm. in the community. Um, but yeah, you should look into it. And then yeah. I just feel like in high school also you're getting um like you're not talking enough, they're not talking about enough. Ugh, I can't talk today. Enough about <laughs> consent. Yeah. Um, and it's all like based on prevention and that kind of carries me into like the college then too Mm -hmm. um it's always prevention like how are we preventing STIs which is great like I love prevention Mm -hmm. um but it's not talking enough about pleasure I don't think and it's Mm -hmm. like when we're talking about sex and pleasure it's almost like people are shaming you for that you know like oh you should be like openly talking about how many sexual partners you have or right. like sex toys or anything like mm-hmm. that it's always like here's some condoms protect yourself be safe mm-hmm. prevent getting pregnant prevent having an STI mm-hmm. again prevention is great but I feel like so many more people should focus on pleasure because like that's should be like a big part of it and so, you know it's so it's so crazy with like even when you mentioned like pleasure should we talk about more it's like to me that kind of seems like oh they would never do that like that's like they would never like why like they would just never do that but it's like but you know they they should like I don't it's like I'm so I'm so like conditioned to thinking that like it's so stigmatized to talk about the pleasure of sex Mm -hmm. that I'm kind of like like I'm like wow like even just the thought of them talking about that I'm like oh there's no way so I definitely agree with you or at least in college they should start talking Mm -hmm. about that more but you know instead of I think that by talking about you know talking about it for for pleasure and stuff like that Mm -hmm. you know I think that that would just decrease the stigma but of course you know like you said some teachers are just very uncomfortable talking about it in that way so it just Oh, yes. it's kind of a step it'll maybe take some time to get there <laughs> yeah which I get it can be like really awkward but I think even acknowledging that like 
oh, hey, this can be really awkward, but let's talk mm-hmm. about it. It can be yeah. like so important because especially like I said, if you're learning sex ed from like porn or something or from other people, you're not learning it. Like even being in tune with yourself and lo- like knowing what you like and you're not like, oh, this is what this person likes. So this is what I have to do. Mm-hmm. Um, like finding like your own kind of like sexual experience and what right. you like is really important too. So yes. I just think it's something that can be talked about more, but For sure. Definitely on college campuses too. Like I know I mentioned consent, I think is so important. And then how to report sexual assault. Again, this could be like a whole other conversation that mm-hmm. we have, but I know like when I was in college, I don't even remember. I think it was in a handbook and they were like, mm-hmm. it's on page 50. This is how you report it done. And that's all I knew for however long I was in college. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know sexual assault happens so much on campuses. So I just think it's really important to like emphasize that more make sure you're almost getting it like every single year. How do you report that? What does it look mm-hmm. like? Um, like all these different things that go into that. Yeah, for sure. And even it's important for colleges too to actually like report these things publicly. I remember watching there's a documentary, I don't remember what it's called, but it was a documentary about like uh sexual assault on college campuses. And um it's talking about how a lot of universities like are not very transparent about it. And I because you know they don't want to hurt their image, but it's like and especially for certain like students, like for athletes and stuff like that, some universities can kind of, you know, their punishments are not enough or it's like, oh, maybe yes. they like they didn't get suspended because they're, they're they're this student, they're that student, they're an athlete, they're this. Mm-hmm. So I think that's so important for universities to be very transparent about like, you know, the the numbers that are taking place on their campus and like what is their approach to handling these situations because you know if if we're seeing this in the media that oh you know they're not if if they're an athlete or if they're this like nothing's really going to happen it's like you may even feel like less inclined to talk about it because you feel like your voice isn't heard because Mm -hmm. you're not as valued as another student in the university's eyes yes I totally agree I think I know it's um was that on Netflix Yes, it was on Netflix. I, I forgot what it's called too, but um, I know like, and it focused on like James. The Hunting Jackson, Ground. Right? Yeah. Yes. The Hunting yes, Ground. Yes. Lady Gaga <laughs> had a song in there and it was a really good song. But yeah. <laughs> yes, I know that one. Yeah. Good one um, for anyone watching if you haven't mm-hmm. already seen yes. it. But, Take a look um, at it. Yeah. So I think that's so important too. And obviously like sex ed is more than just like birth control and the act of having sex is also like gender you know sexual orientation um sexual assault like body image things like that that you like all these things just go into it so yeah yeah uh so Stephanie do you want to talk a little bit about intersectionalities and how that plays a role in sexual health and reproductive justice so as to see how it affects like different communities of people yes and I know like you and I have talked about this so many times in our conversations that literally there's so many intersectionalities that could be played like with sex ed, you know, um, but I'll just touch on a few that we had kind of already talked about. Uh, so one of those things is definitely race. I think this isn't mm-hmm. talked about enough, um, but race can have a huge, um, it can be like a barrier, unfortunately, to accessing, you know, sexual health and reproductive mm-hmm. education and health and things like that. So, I mean, even things like stereotypes, um like people are like oh uh I need a bigger condom I need the magnums Mm. um because I I have a big penis and it's Mm -hmm. like sometimes those can actually fall off because they're too big it's like you don't necessarily need one and I always try to show people like a regular one can fit from here to here you know Mm -hmm. like and I think people don't understand again like magnums are more for like width or girth than like length mm-hmm. um and so like <laughs> just I just mean people yeah. that. but like I hear so many I mean people with penises especially that are like I need a big big condom I need magnums and I'm like mm-hmm. you probably don't but like not to say some people definitely do mm-hmm. um but there's like a high percent of chance that a regular one would fit you just fine and that's okay, okay. <laughs> um but there's like stereotypes or like oh I can't wear one because my penis is too big it's like mm. okay well, like, mm. all these things you know um and then I think with like race too there's a huge like medical mistrust especially mm-hmm. um I often talk about like the black community and touching on like the T- Tuskegee study 
um, to ski experiment. And I won't go into all that, but just um, how they were like, you know, immorally treating these black men and lying to them mm-hmm. about the drugs that they were giving them or not giving them. Um, and then still even with for syphilis treatment. And then even when like penicillin became available, they still wouldn't give them that and mm-hmm. took years and so many people had died. And it was just yeah. a really terrible thing and study. Um, but there's been like a constant history in America of experimenting on African-American people. Yeah. And so I think there's a huge medical mistrust um, because okay, history's shown us that you don't really care about us. So why are you caring now? Like, why should I take this drug mm-hmm. for HIV treatment? Or why should mm-hmm. I take this? Um, like, why should I get an STI like test or something, you know? Um, yeah, I think like race is a huge part and it's not talked about enough. I know I grew up in like a primarily white environment. And so like, I didn't get any of these stats or mm-hmm. any of this like history or background information until I was in college. And like, I'm still learning. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if you feel the same way or what. Yes, I'm definitely still learning. And there's this huge like medical mistrust that, you know, re- results in a lot of people, uh, minorities feeling like, you know, should we trust this? Should we not? And then even here's where I'm going. Um, I, I don't remember the exact, um, I don't remember the exact video, but it was talking about how these uh, medical students were studied uh, to see like, like kind of their like ethnic biases. And it was saying that, oh, like a lot of them felt that, and I'll, I'll put on like the stats on the screen, but um, it was talking about how a lot of these students thought that, oh, like, you know, black people have a higher pain tolerance than white people. Like, like even though a lot of the, like, like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment took place like very much in the past, we still see that there's like these like miscorrelations now, like, mm-hmm. like that medical students are thinking that, mm-hmm. you know, different races have different pain tolerance you know yes. and even just like even and I have to look more into this but their very whitewashed education system like mm-hmm. medical education system is still kind of perpetuating this medical mistrust yes. absolutely and that even goes into like um I mean again a whole other conversation but with mm-hmm. like African-American mothers and giving birth and how there's so much more like uh mortality um mm-hmm. with like black people in America are black mothers and Mm -hmm. their children than there are with white people or white mothers. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a whole thing. Unfortunately, um, you just gotta like keep doing the work, but and like educating people. I know when I talk to a lot of like my friends who are white, they're like, Oh, I had no idea. And it's like, yeah, you're not getting that education in school. Like, why would you, but you still need to like inform yourself, you know? Right. Right. Um, For sure. So yeah, I think that's so important. And I mean, even just where we're at, where we've always been at, because this has always been happening. It's just on video more now, but right, with like right. racism and everything, like um, when you're not seeing clinicians that look like you, it's like, mm-hmm. why should I trust you after, right. you know, George Floyd, everything that happened last summer. And I don't want to mm-hmm. generalize that as everything that happened. And I know this has been going on for centuries. Um but it's just like, it's kind of amplified it more. So like, why am mm-hmm. I going to trust you if you don't look like me or you're white? It doesn't really seem like in the media, the news or experiences I've had that you care about me. It's like, why am I listening mm-hmm. to you now? Right, right. And also, especially if you had some medical, in, in med school, some biased education mm-hmm. that like you're certified in this biased education, like yes. there's definitely that mistrust and like rightfully so unfortunately. Um, and we talked a little bit about like the, how race kind of ties into this, but also just talking about like gender identities and like the, also like the LGBT community. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that plays a role in their, in sex education? Cause I know for me, like I most definitely did not receive any like LGBTQ, like sex ed in my schools. Like we definitely didn't talk about that, which I didn't even really like notice at the time. Yeah. But, um, but I, you know, when I got to college and we were talking about that, cause one of the students in my class was saying, Oh, like I'm in the LGBT community and I never got a sex education that was suitable for me. I was like, wow, I didn't even realize that. And, and the way that that like further like stigmatizes the LGBT community by kind of ostracizing them out of sex education, it like really kind of perpetuates the cycle. And I even found on here on 
I'm going to put the citation down below because I don't remember which side I got this from, but uh, only nine states currently require discussion of LGBTQ identities and relationships to be inclusive and affirming. And, and seven southern states actually prohibit sex educators from talking about LGBTQ identities and relationships. And some of these actually require sex educators to talk about LGBTQ identities in a negative way. So I'm not, you can definitely add on to this, but you know, definitely we need to do a better job about including our lgbtq community in sex ed yeah absolutely it's it's like so eye-opening those stats it's it's kind of like okay well i guess like it makes sense kind of unfortunately but it's just like wow what a long way we have to go you know i know um, it's so unfortunate it's so sad uh but yeah i mean like things that i have like learned about and noticed i think is just even using like heteronormative heteronormative um, like adjectives or words or examples as a sex educator. Like you said, like I got all, you know, heteronormative sex mm-hmm. ed when, whenever I got it. Like mm-hmm. it was really until even after college that I was like expanding like, oh, like, shoot, I need to learn more about people who are in the LGBTQ community. Um, because it's just like, they're, like you said, they're ostracized, they're feeling left out, they're not getting the information, Mm -hmm. um, they're not having that access to that information for a lot of different reasons. It could be like, um, shame that they're feeling from society, from Mm -hmm. parents, from friends, from their partners, uh, or even like clinicians, if they're going in and they're saying, okay, well, I'm a trans man, I still need birth control because I'm having mm-hmm. sex with someone who has a penis and I still mm-hmm. have a vagina and a uterus. And, you know, like I still need birth control even though I'm presenting as a male and I mm-hmm. am a male. Like these are still things I need to talk about with my clinician. So mm-hmm. if the clinician isn't trained or like, you know, in kind of like LGBTQ, like just even being like comfortable talking about that, I think it can be very awkward and very almost like not shameful, but can just be very uncomfortable so it's almost like why do I want to go get treatment if I'm just going to go into a place where that's making me feel uncomfortable or shamed for who I am Mm -hmm. um so I think that's like a huge part of it and I know people are starting to do this more but even not defaulting to like cisgender as like the norm or like Mm -hmm. that shouldn't that shouldn't be the norm Mm -hmm. so I know a lot of people are doing like their pronouns and their bios or their signature lines which is amazing I think everyone should do that I try, and I should have done that when I started that I used she, her pronouns. But, yeah. Um, and I, I realized like, as I was doing your introduction, I was like, I realized I'm totally discussing her no, pronouns right now. So good, sorry. <laughs> no, don't, no, it's okay. And that's like, the thing is we've been so conditioned to do that, you know, like it's like, have been. Uh, we just got to like get out of it. And it's kind of a hard yeah. thing to like break that in society, but it's so important that we do. And I think we're like doing the work. So like like you said yeah we forgot but like we're acknowledging it later I yes think can be like really important too so um yeah I think there's just so much that goes into it and just to recognize that that not everything is like I try to do that when I'm giving like sex ed to school or something my examples will be like I'll try to say partner um mm-hmm. instead of like boyfriend girlfriend or something like that mm-hmm. and I'll try to I'll try to use like maybe some like gender neutral names, um, things like that, like mm-hmm. Taylor or something like that. Uh, so you can't really tell like a lot of, I think this could even go into like images that people have in their clinics, or if you are a sex educator or a teacher or something like that, like the images that you're using in schools to try to be as inclusive and possible with gender. So maybe not have somebody with like long flowing hair and a dress, like maybe they have leg hair and a dress Mm -hmm. and super short hair or whatever, you know, just trying Mm -hmm. to like show that everyone can fit in and trying not to, I mean, that goes even with like race and stuff, like try not to have your images be like centered around race. Or if you do like, make sure you're being inclusive, like have people who are Asian, have people who are black, um, Native American, like include people. And it's not just like all white imagery that we're always seeing. Right, right, for sure. We need that representation. And even like mm-hmm. our like those relationship videos that I watched in high school, it was like oh mostly like white couples. Yes. It's always like white people are the examples mm-hmm. for everything. And I'm like, yes. okay, lack of representation. Yes. Like, so you know, I definitely agree. We definitely 
need more representation in terms of race and also uh, gender identity and like sexual orientation. And I definitely I love like your, everything. Yes. And I, and I love hearing about your approaches to this in your classroom because I think that yeah. like I love how you're saying you use like more gender neutral names you say partner like these are mm-hmm. things that I, I wouldn't even like think would you know think about but I'm like that's like so important because it's like by yeah. saying oh this guy and this girl and their mm-hmm. boyfriend and girlfriend is like just so heteronormative that we don't even yes. like we don't even you know like I think that partner it just sounds much more inclusive so that like you know the LGBT community doesn't have to feel like oh, if it's partner, that just means it's an LGBT couple. No, it could right. mean also, it could mean anything. Anything. Yes. I yeah. like totally agree. Yeah. I think it's so important. And like, trust me, I like mess up sometimes. Like I'll be like, oh, my husband's of my partner, you know, or something mm-hmm. like that. Even when mm-hmm. I'm talking to people, I try to like, like, this is my partner or something, you know, mm-hmm. like even when I'm not doing like sex ed or teaching mm-hmm. in schools, just to try to make it more normal, like amongst my friends yeah. and things like that too so yeah. yeah I think that's something like people could do even if you're not a sex educator you're not a teacher you can just like when you're talking with your friends you're like oh me and my partner went out to eat this weekend like just make that more normal you know yes I love that that's great and and just to kind of transition the topic here is obviously we talked about um how race and gender kind of uh, play a role in how our sex education is, but also finances can also mm-hmm. play a major role in this, you know, depending on like how well is your, from from how well is your school funded to how well is your personal life funded to actually be using these methods that they're talking about. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, how like finances can play a role into access of sex education and, you know, birth control as well? Yes. And I think like you definitely touched on it, like how well your school is funded, where your school is at, like, are you getting quality sex education? I know um, some of the schools near us, it's like the school is literally falling apart um, or they don't have like clean running water and things like that. So it's like, if your school is more worried about those things, they're probably not going to be as worried about your sex education. Like you need those needs met first, you know, and that's what they're fighting for. Um, No fault to them, but it's just like, okay, well, we also need these other things. And Mm -hmm. so, um, I mean, yeah, you have to look at like definitely location too, but then, I mean, even with finances, I always think of accessing birth control. Like, um, I always give people an example, like an IUD with insurance could be 20 bucks, but without Mm -hmm. insurance, it could be up to like five or $600. And who has that money? (laughs) I mean, like there's definitely people who do, but not everyone does. And not everyone even has the money to afford $20, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And then you also have to look at, I mean, people are like, oh, well, some, I don't know if it's honestly the whole U.S. or just some states, but like, oh, the pill is free. Well, like, what if you have a bad reaction to the pill or it doesn't work for you or like Mm -hmm. doesn't work with your schedule? You know, it's just like, there's so many different things that go into it. And so Mm -hmm. I think honestly, all birth control should be free, but um, (laughs) there's like things you have to think about with that too. And then with finances, um, like if you're insured or not insured, but also like, I also throw in there, like abortions are not covered by your insurance. And so it's like, if you need one, do you have the money for that? Because that can be really expensive as well. So, and there's also age restrictions there too. So it's like, if you're trying to get one secretly and not have your parents know it's like, and you're under like, I think 18 Mm -hmm. or something that, you you know, Yes, which you can appeal to like a judge, I believe. Oh, okay. um, but that's so kind complicated. Of, but yes, exactly. And it was kind of <laughs> like, oh my gosh, there's and there's so much shame around that. That yeah. again is like a whole nother conversation. But right. um, yeah, there's just like so many barriers. And think I always tell people too, like there's more than just just what we've talked about with race, LGBT, and finances. It can be transportation. Like if the mm-hmm. closest, if you're in a really rural area, and the closest. Um, clinic to you is like 20 miles away how are you getting there or Mm -hmm. even in the city like I work in um, Detroit a lot and the transportation kind of like sucks and so Mm -hmm. um, just getting around from one side to the other and the cost with bus passes and all these things I mean there's so many barriers and all these things we're talking about I think just like really intersect with each other and then if you look at like your privileges I think too and like what you're up against so 
let's say like, oh, I'm, I'm black and I'm gay and I don't have transportation. I don't have insurance. It's like, I'm not able-bodied. I don't speak English Mm -hmm. or something like all these things are against you and it's so much harder. So even when people talk about like the disparities among races or like in medical school, they're like, well, you know, more people who are gay have, I don't know, like have HIV or something. They're Mm -hmm. talking about these stats. It's like, that's not because of that they're gay it's because Mm -hmm. they have all these barriers and so I don't think people talk enough about those intersectionalities and those barriers they just look at like the stats and it's very black and white Mm -hmm. to them but yes or they um, they do a lot of blaming yes which honestly I'll admit I like used to do that a lot Mm -hmm. like and it took me a lot that's what you're conditioned to do right like I I used to I I used to honestly like I am very ashamed about this but I used to like honestly um I used to kind of be like okay well I mean if the teen pregnancy rates are so high it's kind of like okay well like they decided to do that like they probably mm-hmm. knew there was some risk and they still did it you know yeah. you know they still did it unprotected like okay that's you know a little irresponsible like yeah. I used to like be such almost a, like, like yes no we were, but that's like how we're conditioned to be yeah. and you really have to like take it out of that so that's why I say even like talking with your friends even if you're not a sex educator you can advance this work um so I used to do the same thing yes. I googled just don't have sex you know or yes like, like if you like don't that. have a condom don't like, have sex but it's like but you know? again that goes back to like how we always talk about sex and being like preventive like sex mm-hmm. is supposed to be pleasurable and like you can mm-hmm. it's, if you're of age you can consent then yeah. you can do it and it should be like right. pleasurable. it's not all right. like how do we not get pregnant you know like yes. unfortunately that's something you have to think about because biology yeah uh, one of my mentors always said that like it doesn't matter what we do our bodies are trying to get pregnant at all times so it's like that's a um, really good with, way like, to put it <laughs> even with vasectomies I mean people have vasectomies um mm. or a tubal ligation and they still get pregnant because your body wow. will repair itself because it's trying to get pregnant so it's like that's crazy it's not your fault in birth control is not a hundred percent. Fortunately, only yes, like abstinence is. Mm-hmm. So people don't always think about that, that there are cases where, or even with the pill, it's like, I missed it by this many hours. I missed it by 10 mm-hmm. hours. And like that can throw it off the effectiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, condom usage. If you're not learning the right way to put a condom on, yep. but you like, you still used one, but you didn't mm-hmm. really like pinch the tip or you didn't roll it down all the way, or you um I don't know it fell off or something you didn't realize you had to look for holes or an expiration date it's like all these things that can go wrong so like yeah we use a condom but you still got pregnant or still got yes. an STI yeah so, yeah there's so much that goes into it but I don't yeah. feel, feel shame like you're acknowledging it and moving yes. on and like I'm that's no all longer any like that do. anymore yeah. everyone <laughs> uh, and also that whole pinch the tip thing I didn't even mm-hmm. I didn't even know about that part didn't learn that in high school I don't think I think they were just like wear a condom here's how you put it on like roll it it down yeah Mm -hmm. and even like even just even um the whole idea of if you put it on the wrong way and then you switch it around it's like you can't use it anymore Mm -hmm. like yep nope gotta get a new one or even like when I do like condom tips and tricks like talking about oh you don't want to like have anal sex with this condom then go from anal sex to vaginal sex you like Mm -hmm. need a new condom in between or Mm -hmm. the myths that you hear from people wear two condoms you'll be fine like it's better protection like actually it's worse because they'll rub together or even with lubrication like I'm like a huge advocate of lube and Mm -hmm. I mean like lube with condoms you should always use like water-based is like the best Mm -hmm. for like anything water like Mm -hmm. toys condoms whatever um but like never use you know, like an oil-based lube because it's going to be like, it's going to wear down that latex and it can cause holes or like breakage. Mm. So, I mean, even things like that, but you have to think like, we're not getting this education in high school yes. most of the time, probably not getting it in college. So it's like, where are you getting this? So like, no mm-hmm. wonder we have such high rates in the U.S. of like STIs, yes. pregnancy, like unwind pregnancy, all that stuff. For sure. And I, and I have a stat here actually the U.S. actually ranks first among developed nations in terms of teen pregnancy, abortion, and STIs. So, you know, even though we're a very developed nation and we like to brag about that all the time, it's like, yeah, yeah, we think we're amazing. (laughs) We think we're like, we think we're perfect. And it's like, that's the whole problem is that no, we aren't. So um, we just want to like treat the like you know 
after what happens, but it's not the enough symptoms. about like yes or whatever. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, see the symptoms are not the root cause. Thank you. There needs to be so much more prevention. Like mm-hmm. um again, like pleasure, but like also just like talking about this more openly and not having so much shame around it is so important. Mm-hmm. And like definitely a big advocate of like owning your sexuality, like figuring out your body because even when I'm talking to like parents and um, encouraging them, like I'm not a parent, so I'm never going to tell anyone how to parent their mm-hmm. children, but just yeah, like yeah. encouraging them to use like the correct terminology, like mm-hmm. just like you would talk about, this is your arm, like, okay, this is your penis, or this is mm-hmm. a vulva, this is a vagina, these are your breasts, like mm-hmm. use that correct terminology because it shouldn't be shamed. It's part of your body. So. Yes. yes. And- and so we got to talk a little bit about like how like finances play a role and, uh, and we kind of went a little bit into this, but what are your tips on advancing sex education and access to reproductive health? Now that we kind of addressed some of the problems with the system, what are things that we can do as individuals to promote this? And what are things like teachers can do to, you know, you know, promote better sex education? Yeah. So I think just like, whether you're a teacher or you're talking with your friends or family or your kids or whatever, like trying to use just not heteronormative language um, and not always assuming like cisgender is the normal and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Or like, yeah, I just think it's so important to try to use like pronouns when you're introducing yourself, even at work. Like if you're not a sex educator, but you're working and you're about to do a presentation, you can say like, usually introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Stephanie. I use she, her pronouns. Today, I'm going to be talking about this. Like, just slip it in there. No one's really going to say anything. Yeah, and it's helpful. Yes, and if there are people who, like, recognize it or maybe who are part of the LGBTQ community, like, they're going to be very grateful for that because it's like you're not just assuming that you use she, her pronouns because you'll Mm -hmm. never know someone's pronouns unless they tell you. So, um, or how they identify unless they tell you. So, I just think like definitely if you're not a sex educator, you can still do this work, you know, among like friends and family. Um, Other thing I always tell people, and I know we talked about this in our conversations, but I was never like big into politics at all. I'd be like, I hate Mm -hmm. politics. I don't want to hear about it. Every time there was like an election coming up, I'd be like, oh, here we go. Like, yeah, (laughs) like all these things in the mail. It's like, I don't want to hear it, you know, um, you have to also think that's like, a very big privilege to think like that too Mm -hmm. like the fact that I didn't a lot of times have to worry about things or like you know even if I don't hold power in one category you know in the world like maybe it's like race or something like that or you know males have more power in the U.S. than females it's like one of those things but it's like I had enough power and privilege to not have to worry that much Mm -hmm. so and I think that's how a lot of people think about it like oh I care about social justice issues but like not enough to call my yes. local politician or my representative. And it's like, that's how they make those choices. If they're hearing from enough people of their mm-hmm. constituents, like that we don't agree with what you're doing and we're going to vote you out next cycle. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. I, I need to get on it, you know? Interesting. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I never realized how important that was until I had an internship with Planned Parenthood and I interned on like the advocacy side. Um, but that was very eye opening to me. Just like, oh, like, shit like politics are really important and um like even if I'm not doing it for me I need to do it for ev- everyone else who doesn't have yeah. a voice or doesn't have this privilege to call their their senator their you know representatives or whatever right. um write letters call I mean there's so many websites now you can even like google like how to text my representative there's hmm. things like there's different causes that sometimes like you go to a website it'll automatically you just text like a certain number, you know, um, and it'll like reply with a text. And you just have to sign your name. Like the text hmm. is already written or oh, the email. Nice. Is, yeah. Or the email is like already written for you. You just have to like input your name. Right. Um, so if you don't want to do like all the work and like compose a whole email or a phone call, there's like scripts. And I just don't think people realize that enough. Like I know sometimes I like just talk a lot and can get off track and sometimes get flustered if I'm put on the spot so Mm. for people like that like that's been helpful for me is like having those scripts so if you look or you just call an organization or somewhere you care about I mean this can go for not just sex that it's like anything you care about if you look Mm -hmm. it up like a lot of people will be like yeah call the senator and or call your representative and here's the scripts and you can just like read off of it Mm, that's awesome 
I, I think didn't it's even like know about there. that script yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I think great. I've seen it a lot with like the GoFundMe stuff too. There's things okay. like that. Like, take it the next step. Write a letter to your representative, and then mm. it's like already written for you. Or you can do it yourself if you want to do that. But um, I know for me, that's been like really helpful to have those scripts yeah. when I'm calling or like writing emails. I'm like, I don't know what to say to make it yeah. sound really professional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is also um, like because that can be so intimidating. But you know, that's so great that they already have like resources out there for you that you can literally mm-hmm. just use, call, and. We made it, we made some impact, hopefully. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, I mean, those are important. I'm trying to look at my notes, so I don't leave anything out, but um, oh, like donating if you have the privilege and you are able to donate. I mean, like five dollars can go a long way. If everyone mm-hmm. don- donated five dollars, it'd be like a huge amount of money, you know. So, like, find those causes that you really care about. Um, I know I try to donate at least once a year, if not more, to like Planned Parenthood and things okay. like that. Um, just because those are it's an organization I really care about but I mean any organization I think you can do this with anything but especially like reproductive health organizations or a clinic that's local um, is like so important and uh, even using your insurance like I always think like using your insurance at Planned Parenthood it helps those people who go there who are not insured Um, Mm. uh, in which I don't know now because like I think well, in Michigan, I don't know if that's just Michigan, but like Title Ten might have changed. But anyway, just look it up; it'll it'll like tell you. But yeah, yeah, there's yeah. just so many so many things you can do, and just um, even volunteering to like be a clinic escort um, for people who are going in. Like when I worked at Planned Parenthood, there would be some days where like different clinics are like different. I worked in the city, so we didn't have too many, mm-hmm. you know, like protesters. But when I went and visited another clinic, like there'd be tons. They'd be like don't do it don't do it I'm like I'm here to work like but can you imagine already feeling shamed if you are going in for an abortion or something and then there's like 20 30 people yelling at you it's like just to get health care because abortion is health care like just to get health care you have people yelling or even if you're going in there for birth control or like I was going in there for work it's like Mm, you're yelling at me for working like yeah it's 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 like also also there's a lot of assumptions too when people like do that like don't do it don't do it. it's like okay like what yeah. if you're just going yeah like you said you're going in for work what if you're going yes. in like that sounds like or like a, a cancer screen maybe I'm just getting right. a cancer screen here but ugh, and people yeah. forget that like Planned Parenthood does a lot more than abortions when people are like disband Planned Parenthood yes. defund Planned Parenthood it's like they do a lot more than abortions they do <laughs> sex education <laughs> they their website was very helpful on finding this information yes. um you know they have a lot of like affordable services affordable birth mm-hmm. controls so you know yeah. all you people with the protesting signs and everything yeah. please don't mm-hmm. attack everyone that goes in there oh, okay. you're you don't even a lot know. of assumptions <laughs> it would be clinics that it doesn't we don't even offer that service there but they're oh, wow. yelling and it's like wow okay. it's like can you not to turn yes not to turn this into like a whole yeah, 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 yeah. conversation but oops but yeah I mean <laughs> it's just it's just ridiculous wow. just um mm-hmm. like reading articles like you said like you looked up some stats and like it doesn't take that long to find this stuff you mm-hmm. know um you can find like CDC you know World Health Organization different things like that you can find a lot of these stats pretty quickly mm-hmm. so um just like educating yourself obviously like I know you're doing great things with your channel and like I have my sex ed page but like doing your own research too and trying to be like okay I'm not just pulling it from like um abstinenceonly.com I don't know Mm -hmm. (laughs) making sure it's making sure it's like a credible source and stuff like that too because you can do this education you know you can educate yourself does not have to all be from somebody but I mean even if like you go on Instagram following sex educators can be really important too and like Mm -hmm. reading books and yeah yeah and for sure and there's a lot of great sex educators on instagram and on social mm-hmm. media obviously you want to look into their backgrounds make sure that you know they actually have some qualifications yeah. like stephanie <laughs> obviously has a lot of experience but um yeah there's like so many helpful resources out there so mm-hmm. and planned parenthood is definitely one of them if you want to look into more like sex education yeah. stuff and also yeah. there's a lot of great videos out there as well so yeah amazing those are all- videos yeah, those are all great resources. Like even I'll oh, just throwing some more out there now that I'm thinking about it, but Bedsider, like B-E-D Sider, S-I-D-E-R um, dot org 
has like mm-hmm. really great information for like birth control and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's, like you said, there's so many like websites and different things, yeah. but yeah. that was always like a big helpful one for me. And then like love is respect.org is great for like healthy relationships. Mm-hmm. Scarlet and then, teen. Um, Good yes. One. Yep. And then, I mean, even um, advocates for youth, I use that one a lot. So <laughs> There's so many out there. So I guess like if anyone has questions, you can yeah. find my Instagram or they can ask you, but yeah, um, there's just literally so many resources to like educate yourself. Wow. And and I actually didn't even know about some of those websites until I took my sex education class. So I started mm-hmm. looking at some of those like Scarlet Teen and others and, and they have a lot of great um, like blogs and articles yeah. to look at. So um definitely check those out everyone mm-hmm. um and just um oh for like questions or even like uh questions to maybe ask a clinician mm-hmm. and stuff like that do you have any tips for like when people you know maybe want to ask their doctors or <laughs> clinician stuff but maybe they're you know nervous or if they want to yeah. talk to people like how should they approach these conversations who should they be going to to have these conversations mm-hmm. yeah I think like if you have any questions essentially about like or I mean, not essentially, especially about like your health, ask your doctor, like when you're mm-hmm. at your office, I mean, they've, they've probably like heard it all, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and so like, don't be shamed. And like, if you feel very uncomfortable with your doctor, I know, again, this is kind of a privilege to say this, but like, if you can find another one, find another one or ask for a mm-hmm. different doctor at that clinic, because mm-hmm. like you, that's very important. You want to be comfortable with your doctor. Um, but these can be really awkward. You can even say like, okay, this is really awkward, but like, I have this question or this thing that I'm wondering and whatever. Um, I just feel like go for it. Ask it. Your health is too important to not ask questions about it. You know, like this is your body or even Mm -hmm. if you, um, like I was talking with somebody, like if it's a sex question, find maybe a sex educator on Instagram. Like again, make sure they're qualified, like you said, but if you really feel uncomfortable with your doctor, like that's the beautiful thing about social media now is like mm-hmm. there's sex educators. Like I know somebody reached out to me and he was like, I'm unable to hold an erection for too long. And again, I, you know, I had to be like, okay, I'm not a medical professional. Yes. yes. One, don't send me pictures and like or anything <laughs> like that. Like I medically can't tell you what to do, but like, yes. here's like an idea, like talking about like cock rings and things like that. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh my God, it helps so much. You know? So like, uh, I mean, sex educators can help like, yeah, uh, stuff, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, even just reaching out to like professionals on Instagram can be so important. And you know, like, I don't know if they'll respond all the time. So I know some mm-hmm. pages are like tons of people. They probably get messages all day. Yes. But I mean, that's, an, that's a route now too, that I don't think like, I didn't have that growing up because my mm-hmm. cell phone, like all I could do on it was play snake. So yes, <laughs> I mean, yes. Or Pac-Man. Uh, yes. So Tetris. I mean, use your resources, you know, yeah. I would say don't always look things up on like WebMD because it'll be like, okay. you're going to die in a week, but yes. um, oh my God, it's so scary. <laughs> but, like, yeah. Ask your doctor, like, like I said, your health is too important not to be like taken seriously. So even if your doctor like kind of like laughs or makes a weird face, like, I mean, screw them. Like yeah, they're going to they give you the information. Be, but, yeah, yeah, they should be, but they're going to give you the information. And if they yeah. don't like, you know, find somewhere else, like it's okay. Like take that health into your own hands if you can. So Yeah. And I, and I was going to add on to that is I think that sometimes it's like nerve wracking to like ask questions or it's like embarrassing to talk about certain things even, or maybe different health issues that people are experiencing. Just like you're saying that guy's talking about erectile dysfunction. I know Mm -hmm. some men can feel like embarrassed about that, but I think it's just important. Everyone like your body is your body. Don't feel embarrassed about certain things. Mm -hmm. Obviously talk it over with the person that you are, you know, you know, having sex with of course but you know like don't feel ashamed I know I think with like the sex culture that we have it's always very like boastful all the time like Mm -hmm. I want to be the sexiest whatever that when people have like issues or whatever or some like thing that Mm -hmm. they're nervous about it's like that can kind of this this image can take over like how they actually feel or Mm -hmm. any concerns that they have so it's just important like you know, don't worry about what other people think, like get yes. the answers you need. And Absolutely. you know what, like, I know some people be, they feel like, oh, well, this certain thing I have isn't very sexy or whatever, but you know what? That's okay. 
You know like, what? Own it. Own your body. Own yes. it. Okay. Like, don't absolutely. feel ashamed. Oh, I always talk about this too because it's like in, like you said, like in media, mainstream media, especially like movies. I always say like mm-hmm. the sex scenes are like so passionate, and it's like yes. everyone's like sweating, but not too much. No one's yes. like, but they're like sweating enough that it's sexy and like, right. you know, it's so like whatever. But like you can laugh. Like sex isn't always like that, you know. Like sometimes yes. something happens, like someone farts, or like it's funny. You know what I mean? Like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's not always like super like the movies you know yes it's not always, oh my gosh know. yes it's just the movies, it's everyone like, are so unrealistic everyone looks like, beautiful it's right like, oh and my god and it's looks good yes and it's always like um I just I just can't it's like too much like, <laughs> things are different you know like in real life the real life is not the movies and I think that right. goes again it's so important so I was saying like for high schoolers especially like if you're not learning this from your like you know from schools or anything you're learning it from porn and like so mm-hmm. that's why you also have to teach pleasure to an extent like in high mm-hmm. school because it's like otherwise you're just getting that from porn like that's not realistic either mm-hmm. um and so I mean just even talking about that like I said we could probably talk for hours yeah about this, but yes. I mean like own your body everybody's body's different like whatever you have on your mm-hmm. body or down there or wherever like it's somebody it's not the same as anyone else's that's like mm-hmm. what's so beautiful about it you know yes so yeah yeah and you know what like she said own it and mm-hmm. if you have questions get those answers don't yes. feel too nervous to talk about it and cause... don't feel shame so, I mean yes. it's just like even if you're like into something with sex like there's somebody yes. else who's also into that you know yes I mean? oh my gosh them, so. exactly like <laughs> so, that's a whole other conversation too yes. but like don't be as long as it's like consent is there like you right. know you're two adults consenting to whatever mm-hmm. like it's okay it's healthy you know mm-hmm. so and then also just touching on this now I just mm-hmm. thought of it too like um if you're abstinent too like that's okay as well like yeah I think like you said like we're always talking about sex and like pleasure and yeah blah, blah, blah. but like if you're not having sex with anyone like that's okay too that's yes, your choice like don't fine. don't feel shame for like not wanting to have sex or not right sex or whatever like yes don't because there's so many people who are like oh I had sex with three people the other week like and you're like wow I haven't had sex in like years or ever yeah, or something like yeah. that like that's okay too like yeah, I mean, I it's all normal it's all okay. right like yeah. some people I just kind of touching off this real quick is some people feel like like oh if you're this age and you're a virgin like that's mm-hmm. pathetic like no it's <sighs> and not, not to mention virginity is a social construct it's not yes. a real thing it's like it's it's a you're abstinent and that's okay like mm-hmm. uh, yeah it's just I like you. you do you everything will be fine like stay in your own lane don't worry about me yeah yes <laughs> like be be who you are and mm-hmm. that's the takeaways from today yes and- absolutely <laughs> <laughs> stephanie thank you so much for being in this video you are incredible your insights are amazing and you know definitely everyone like she talked about, you know, go write those letters, make those phone calls, check your privilege, and also educate yourself, use those resources, and stop being so heteronormative. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> Stephanie, I'm not sure if you have any, like, last words or anything you want to give out, contact info, verbally um, or whatever, but. I mean, I know you're going to throw it in there. Yeah. Again, the like, IG mm-hmm. is sex ed with stuff, um, but I mean always open to any questions through that I'm not gonna like reveal your identity so like mm-hmm. literally I've had like kind of all kinds of questions there don't feel ashamed very open um mm-hmm. and I have lots of resources for you but I mean I really appreciate you having me on this page I was so excited to talk to you I feel like we have great conversations yes so, yeah. you are an awesome you are incredible and I had a great time talking to you so thank you so much everyone go check out her page I'll put the info at the end